In this lecture, we're going to finish our discussion on protein sequencing. Now, previously, we focused on proteins that consist of a single polypeptide chain, and we discussed how we can sequence the amino acids in those types of proteins. But we know many proteins inside our body, for example, hemoglobin, have more than one polypeptide chain, so they have quaternary structure. And the question is, if a protein has quaternary structure, if a protein consists of two or more polypeptide chains, how do we sequence these types of proteins? So how do we determine the amino acid sequence in proteins that consist of two or more polypeptide subunits? So there are three steps that we essentially have to follow. In step one, what we want to do is we want to take our quaternary structure and break it down. We want to denature our protein. We want to break down the non-covalent interactions and the disulfide bonds that exist between those two polypeptide chains. So we need to expose the quaternary structure to a denaturing solution. For example, we can use urea or guanidine hydrochloride to basically break down those non-covalent interactions holding our two polypeptide chains. And then if we have disulfide bonds between our two polypeptide chains, we want to expose them to beta mercaptoethanol to basically break down those covalent interactions. So let's suppose we're dealing with a protein that consists of two individual subunits, two polypeptide chains. We have the green one and we have the blue one. And these red lines are basically our disulfide bond. So if we take this protein, place it into a solution that contains urea and beta mercaptoethanol, we're going to denature the structure and separate these two polypeptide chains. So we're going to have a mixture of the green individual chain and the blue individual chain. And notice that in this particular example, the blue one is greater than our green one. So the next step is step number two. So once we, uh, once we uh, separate that structure, once we separate these polypeptide chains, once we have the mixture of these two different types of polypeptide chains, the next question is, how do we purify our mixture and isolate these two polypeptide chains into different compartments, into different beakers, for example? Well, we have to use some type of purification method. Now, because in this case, the size of this is greater than the size of this, we can use gel electrophoresis. So SDS page, also known as SDS polyacrylamide, gel electrophoresis. And the reason we use this setup is because it allows us to separate the two polypeptide chains based on their size and mass. So, here we have the electrophoresis setup. We basically take the mixture of these two proteins, we put them inside the well, and we wait some time. And what will happen is, because this has a greater size, it will experience a greater resistance as it travels down to the bottom of our gel. And so what happens is, after some time passes, this will migrate less than the smaller green protein. And so we're going to form two bands. One of the band, the green band, corresponds to this protein, and the second band corresponds to this larger polypeptide chain. So once we form these two bands, we can now isolate these two proteins. So we take out this protein, place them into beaker one. We take out the second protein, the second polypeptide chain, and place it into beaker number two. So now we have two beakers with these two different polypeptide chains. And now all we have to do in step three is do exactly what we did, follow the same exact procedures that we followed with those individual polypeptide chains as we discussed previously. So what that means is, for example, let's suppose we take that beaker number one that contains our green polypeptide chain. What we have to do is we have to expose that poly, uh, the polypeptide chain to proteolytic molecules that cleave our peptide at specific locations. So we essentially cut up and divide this long fragment, this long polypeptide chain into many small fragments. And then we take each one of these fragments 
and we run Edmund degradation on each one of these fragments. And that allows us to basically determine exactly what that sequence is of each one of these fragments. And then we repeat the process with a different proteolytic enzyme and eventually we can basically uh, find what the order is of these different fragments in that polypeptide chain. And then we repeat the process with this larger blue polypeptide chain. At the end, we basically are able to sequence what those uh, amino acids are and how they're arranged in that polypeptide chain. So once again, once we isolate the two subunits, we can now determine what the sequence of amino acid is separately. So we take, for example, this mixture, we expose it to, or this polypeptide chain, we expose it to proteolytic enzymes, we cut up into these many fragments, then we run the Edmund degradation process to determine what the specific sequence is of each one of these fragments, and then we repeat the process with a different proteolytic enzyme, we get a different set of fragments, and we again run Edmund degradation to find the sequence, and then we use the two sets of fragments to basically, uh, to basically find what the correct order is of these fragments with respect to one another. And in that manner, we can basically find what the sequence is of amino acids in this polypeptide, and then we repeat that with the blue polypeptide. And at the end, we know exactly what the sequence of amino acid is in this protein that consists of these two polypeptide chains. Now, the final piece of information that we need to know is where exactly are these disulfide bonds? So we want to answer the following question. How do we determine the position of the disulfide bonds in that protein that contains these disulfide bridges? So we have to follow three different steps. And what we use is a special process known as diagonal electrophoresis, which is basically two different applications of the gel electrophoresis process, as we'll see in just a moment. So let's suppose this is the protein, and in the protein we have these two polypeptides, and they are connected to one another at two locations by disulfide bonds. So this is disulfide bond number one, and disulfide bond number two. Now, what we want to do is, in, uh, what we want to do initially is, we want to take this protein and expose it to some type of proteolytic enzyme, and we want to make sure that that proteolytic enzyme does not break these disulfide bonds. So we take our protein, we expose it to our proteolytic chemical, and what that proteolytic chemical does is it cleaves at different sections on these two polypeptides. For example, let's say it cleaves, let's erase these for a moment so that we're not confused. So that proteolytic chemical, for example, let's say cleaves at this location, then it cleaves um, at this location, it also cleaves at this location, and so we produce the following four different fragments. So we break this bond here, we produce fragment number one, so let's label this fragment as fragment number one, then we cleave this bond here, we produce this fragment number two, and we also produce, once we cleave this section here, we produce this fragment number four, and notice that because the proteolytic chemical leaves our disulfide bonds intact, these red bonds are unbroken, and so this entire fragment number three actually consists of this green section that came from the green polypeptide and the blue section that came from that blue polypeptide, and we do this for a specific reason because this is an important part of the process of diagonal electrophoresis as we'll see in just a moment. So these are basically our steps in diagonal electrophoresis. Now, once we have these four fragments in our mixture, in our solution, we now place them onto a sheet and we run electrophoresis on that sheet 
along the horizontal direction. So we now place the fragments onto the corner of a sheet and we run electrophoresis along the horizontal direction. So essentially we place them onto the corner and they begin to migrate. And once again, the ones that are heaviest, the ones that are largest will essentially migrate the least. And so because fragment three is the largest, this will basically travel the least distance. And because fragment two is the smallest, smallest, it will travel the greatest distance. And then four is slightly uh, smaller than, uh, what is it, one. And so four will be here and one will be here. So following electrophoresis in the horizontal direction, this is our distribution of proteins of bands that we actually get. And notice that protein three consists of a blue section, this section, and the green section, this section here. So let's call this blue section, let's call it 3B, and let's call this green section 3A because that will become important in just a moment. So this is step A of diagonal electrophoresis. What do we do in step B? Well, now in step B, once we have the separation of these four fragments, we now want to expose the sheet that contains these separated proteins to a special type of chemical. So we essentially vaporize the chemical and we expose our sheet to this chemical that essentially breaks our disulfide bond. So the sheet is now exposed to a chemical, uh, namely a performic acid. So the vaporized version of performic acid and that performic acid breaks those disulfide bonds. And now these fragments that were initially connected are no longer connected because the, these two bonds are broken by the vaporized performic acid. Now let's move on to C. So now these two have been broken and now in step C, we run a second round of gel electrophoresis on that same sheet under the same conditions, but now we run it in a perpendicular direction. Instead of running it this way, we run it going up. And that's exactly why we have these two axes on the following graph. So the x-axis describes the horizontal electrophoresis the first round of electrophoresis and this is the second round of electrophoresis so now they begin to migrate up now what happens is at the end of our experiment this is what we basically see this is our diagonal line that gives this name the diagonal electrophoresis procedure so because uh, se uh, segment or fragment two four and one do not consist of two or more fragments, they are individual fragments, but because this one consists of two fragments, we're going to see the following distribution. So one, four, and two are simply single fragments. Nothing has happened to them. They traveled as shown this distance here, this distance here, and this distance here. So because two is the smallest, it traveled greatest along this vertical direction, four is this segment here, and because four is slightly smaller than one, it travels farther than one. But notice what happened to three. Because three, after we exposed it to performic acid, has been separated because these two bonds broke, three now consists of 3A and 3B that are not connected. And so when we run gel electrophoresis along the vertical direction, what happens is they will actually separate because 3A is much smaller than 3B. And so 3A will essentially travel higher up then 3B and 3B because it is the largest out of all these fragments will be found lowest along the vertical direction. And so now we know that there exists disulfide bonds between these two fragments 3A and 3B. And once we know that, we can basically cleave them further and determine what the sequence is by using the Edmund degradation process as we discussed here. And once we know the sequence, once we know where those cysteine amino acids are, we can determine how these cysteine amino acids are actually connected. So this is how we basically know what the 
the position is of our disulfide bonds by running this special type of uh, procedure known as diagonal electrophoresis.